Let us pray together. Lord, we do give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for this weekend. We give you thanks for the visit of the Pope to our area uh, and for all those who are being touched by his ministry. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather here together to worship you, to spend some time in your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit on us, open our hearts and open our minds to whatever it is that you would have for us this morning. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, we are beginning a new sermon series, and this series is going to be a little bit different than anything we have done before. Uh, this is probably going to be a new experience for you, uh, but fear not, it's a new experience for me as well. Um, really, a lot of this material might have been good to, to do in a Sunday school series. Uh, however, there are much fewer of you in Sunday school than there are here in worship. Uh, and this is, this is really important uh, stuff that I think that we all uh, need to, to wrestle with. Uh, this is really going to be a very, I hope, practical uh, series because we're going to be looking practically at how we, each of us, as Christians, and we, all of us together as the church, can actually do that which we are called to do. Now, what is that? Well, first of all, hopefully, those of you who were here, even though it was three weeks ago now, remember we just finished a series on grace. Now, grace, as I said several times in that series, I think is the central concept of the Christian faith. It's what brings us here. It's, it's, what, it's what we trust in, because the, the message of the gospel is that we, on our own, are a bit of a mess. We, we tend to make poor choices, which muddle and muddy our own lives and sometimes the lives of those around us. And it doesn't bring honor or glory to God. But grace says it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been, God loves you. God loves you so much that He Himself came and He died on the cross to forgive all of that mess, to forgive every bad choice that you have ever made or will make. That's grace, that God loves us and God has created, God Himself has made a way for us to be forgiven, to be brought back into relationship with Him. That's good news. That's the message that, that we should be sharing with the world. But if we have this grace, if we are forgiven, if we buy into that, if we, if we trust in Jesus as our Savior, the other piece is, and we say this frequently, but I'm not sure we really let it into our brains, He's not just our Savior, He's also our Lord. That means He is our boss. He is in charge. You see, you are no longer your own. You have been bought with a price. Christ came and He died for you. He gave His life that you might have life. And so your life really belongs to Him. And what are we supposed to do with that? What is it that we're, we're called to do if Jesus is our Savior and our Lord? Well, conveniently, Jesus told us. In Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 6, this is after Christ has been crucified, dead, and buried, and now he has risen from the dead, and he's hanging out with his 
his followers. And in verse 6, it tells us, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, remember, these people that had been following him for the past three years, even though he told them differently over and over again, they had it in their minds that he was going to be the next king of Israel, that he was going to ascend to power, he was going to take over the nation, he was going to kick the Romans out, and he was going to reestablish Israel as its own sovereign nation. And I think they were kind of hoping that they were going to be part of his administration. But then their hopes and dreams were crushed when he was arrested and tried and convicted and crucified. The last three years had been a waste. The dream was over. But then on the third day, he rose again, and, and with him rose their old hopes and dreams. Now, maybe, he's going to reestablish the kingdom. I mean, imagine that. A king they can't kill. A king that lives forever. And will be in his administration. How cool is that? But that was not the plan. Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but, and here it is, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I love that. Jesus gives them their final instructions. You are to go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then he ascends into heaven. And his followers, and it's not just the 12 apostles here. This is his larger group of disciples, of those following him. They were probably closer to 150 at this point. Still not a very big church. But they're all standing around. Looking at where he was. And these two men appear about among them and say, what are you doing? Why are you standing around? He told you what you need to do, now go! He told us, you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, first of all, what is a witness? Well, technically, a witness is somebody, and we're just talking about sort of a regular witness now, not, not an expert witness, but a regular witness is somebody who has seen or heard or experienced something, and based on what they have seen or heard or experienced, they are able to give testimony to what they saw or heard or experienced. That's a witness. And that's what we are called to do. We, we don't have to be an expert witness. We don't have to be able to explain the, the biology or the chemistry or, or the physics of what we saw or heard or experienced. We just have to tell what we saw or heard or experienced. That is what a witness is. Now, at the end of Matthew's gospel, you might remember the, the Great Commission is what we call it may refer to the same event that we've just read about here. But in Matthew's gospel, 
he tells us that Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So you are to be my witnesses and you are to make disciples. Now what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody who follows a teacher, who spends time with them, who learns from them, but just not just book knowledge, who spends enough time with the teacher that they learn to become like the teacher. They learn to live life in the same way as their teacher. We are called to be disciples. And I want you to think for a minute. You should all have a bulletin. And on the front of our bulletin, it says, our mission statement, to know Jesus and to make him known. To know Jesus, that's discipleship. That is spending time with Jesus, spending time in his word, spending time getting to know who Jesus is, what matters to him, where his heart is, how he would live life. And as we begin to learn of him to become, to become like him, to begin to live our lives as he would live our life, that's discipleship. And to make him known, to tell other people what we experience as we spend time with Jesus, to tell other people what we see and hear and experience of Jesus in our lives, that's witness. So we have these two aspects as part of our mission there. What we say that we are as a church, this is, this is what we do. Discipleship and witness. But how do we do that? You see, I think often, and the church is somewhat responsible for this, we think, uh-oh, here comes another program, another thing we have to spend money to develop and get curriculum and attend seminars. And the fact is that that's one of the things we struggle with as a church in our current world today. People are busy. You're busy. I'm busy. We have a lot of things going on. And the church has always been, well, the church hasn't always been, the church for a long time has been all about programs, about doing stuff. And the problem is that most of the stuff that we do focuses on here. That this is where the important stuff happens at the church. That we're really about worship on Sundays and how many people we can get into the pews and worship on Sunday. Now, don't get me wrong. Worship on Sunday is great. I recommend it. I hope that you will all come together because it is important that we gather together as the body of Christ, that we worship God together, that we learn together, that we encourage one another. But this is not what it's all about. We come here to be trained, equipped, encouraged, and sent out. Most of you, if you look at your week, the amount of time you spend here at the church, even though there are some weeks when it seems like you ought to just set up a cot and live here, you don't. Most of you spend most of your time somewhere else. Working or going to school or going shopping or doing whatever it is that you do. I want you to think about this for a minute. Now, I hate to use a war analogy, but the Bible does it frequently, so I figure it must be all right. When two countries are at war, one of the, the things that they tend to do is to deploy and recruit spies people who, who infiltrate 
the enemy territory. People who go in and, and try to infiltrate every aspect of the military and, and society of the other country. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, think about this. We're called to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're called to make disciples of all nations. What if what if we could plug operatives into every part of society? Our schools, our hospitals, our retirement communities and nursing homes, our industry, our businesses. What if we could put witnesses in all of those places? Oh, yeah. We have operatives in all of those places. You. You spend most of your lives out there living life in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your supermarkets, in your jobs. What if we all began to see all of that as our mission field? What if we began to see every aspect of our life, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, as a place where God has put us, as a place where He has placed us to be a witness? I understand that in some places, public schools for instance, you cannot overtly share your faith. But you can live it. You can pray for your students, maybe not in the classroom out loud, but you can be a witness by the way that you live your life. I have a brief video clip uh, to kind of get your minds thinking a little bit. I will just warn you, this is a British production, so it may be a little bit hard to understand, <laughs> uh, but I think you will get the picture. Meet Anne. Anne always thinks of herself as fairly ordinary. Just an ordinary single, middle-aged mum with an ordinary, tiring job. She navigates through the ordinary dramas of life, but at the end of the day, she just gets on with it. Nothing to shout about, nothing to write home about. At least that's what she feels. But in truth, Anne doesn't get too much time to think about all this because Anne's busy. She has lots of people making demands on her. She has children that need to be taken to school, to friends, to shops, and often feels like a taxi driver. But she's not a taxi driver, she's a teaching assistant in a challenging school. She supports the teacher, puts up displays, works with small groups of children, at times acting like a cross between a sheepdog and a NATO peacekeeping force. She enjoys the job, most days but gets home really tired, just in time to put a taxi driver's hat on again. So to keep fit, she goes to her aerobics classes twice a week. To keep sane, she makes sure she makes time for friends who can share the good times and the bad times with her. And at the end of the day, she winds down in front of the telly, whilst talking to her parents on the phone, feeling slightly guilty that she's not seen them for a while. That's Anne. But one other thing about Anne, a few years ago, she became a Christian. And since then, she's lived with the question that won't go away. How can I be used by God? She's looked around church, but it's not so easy to know what she can offer. She can't play a musical instrument, doesn't want to get involved in children's work, hasn't enough experience to lead a small group, and would only be asked to sing if she were the last person left on earth. However, she's part of the fresh road to him because she has a nice smile. She's part of the welcome team. 
but to her it all feels too little. She's fallen into the trap that loads of us fall into, of thinking that God only wants to use us in activities that are linked to church programs. But the reality is that Anne has front lines all around her. Places where she spends much of her time, where God has already placed her, and where he's using her to make a difference. At work, at home, in cafes, in aerobic classes. She's surrounded by people that God loves and she could pray for, drop the in the odd word, continue to love in practical ways and really make a difference. This is her mission field. These are the strategic places where God has placed her. This is her front line. So here's the question. What would she feel about her life if she realised that in fact this ordinary life is no ordinary life at all? She'd still be the taxi driver for the kids on the back seat. But she'd see that her calling as a parent goes far beyond caring. She'd realise that she's the best teacher these kids will ever have about how to live the unnatural life as a Christian. Unnatural forgiveness, unnatural grace, unnatural mercy all need to be seen to be believed. But when seen, they'll never forget the power of this name. Used by God. At work, she might not feel hugely important. After all, she's not running the school. The truth is, she's far more significant than that. She's an agent of the kingdom, the kingdom whose king rules the universe. As she works diligently, she's already demonstrated the difference that being a Christian can make to life. And when some of the big questions of life come up, as they do from time to time, she's got real wisdom to share, used by God. And when she's with her friends, she talks about her life and faith with humour, honesty and a welcome sense of normality. And she's praying that her friends would join her in her faith in Jesus, used by God. And whilst their aerobic classes are no place to be singing, shine Jesus, shine, whilst desperately fighting for breath, it continues to do her good. She feels just a little bit more alive at the end of each session and goes home with just a touch more resilience as she mediates between children wanting to watch different channels on the same TV used by God. And Anne wonders how God could use her. Anne, look around you. This is your front line, the front line that God wants to use you on, the one he's placed you in, the one that he's using to form you into the shape of Jesus. It's the front line that's unique to you. Because there's no one exactly like Anne, is there? Except Reg, who retired years ago, and Beth, who's at college having a great time, and Kwame in the bank, and Nicola, who's looking for a job, and Graham and Elaine, who's just had a baby, and Sharon, and Zoe, and Matt, and Danielle, and Susan, and Tony, and Paul, and, and, you. So I said this was going to be a series unlike any that we had done before. And one of the aspects of that is that I hope that this series will become, dare I say, interactive. Because I want you guys to think. I want you to, in that fact, here is your homework for this week. I want you to pay attention to what you do all week. I want you to think about where you go, where you spend your time. Who do you see day after day? Is it your favorite checkout clerk at the grocery store? Is it the person that you sit with at the bus stop? Who are the people that you see over and over? Where do you go? Where do you spend your time? And begin thinking and begin praying about where are opportunities? Where is it that, that God might want me to, to do something? It, it could just be praying for somebody. But you know, maybe after you've been praying for them for a few days, you might then approach them and say, you know, I don't know why, but I've just, I've been praying for you lately, and I was wondering how things are going. Is there anything specific that I could be praying for? Doesn't have to be weird. You're just, you're just expressing care and concern for people around you. And we found, I know 
when we were doing the arts and crafts festivals and various things, one of the things that uh, the people manning the table often would do is offer to pray with people that just came up to look for information. And I don't think, Joanne, that anybody <laughs> reacted ne negatively to that. In fact, people were thrilled. It's, it's intimidating. It's a little scary. But we're called to be witnesses. And, and let's not forget that before he even gives that instruction, he tells them, you will receive power by the Holy Spirit. You see, we don't do this on our own. We, we don't serve God alone. We don't serve just under our own brilliance or intelligence or power. We serve because God gives us the power to serve. He gives us the words to say. He prompts us. He gives us courage. So, let us begin to consider where is it that we spend our time? Where are we already? You see, this isn't about adding something new to your schedule. This isn't about just creating something else for you to do. It's about the stuff you're already doing, the places you're already going, the people that you're already seeing. But allowing God to show you opportunities. Opportunities to reach out in love and grace and mercy. You might even find yourself partnering with God in changing somebody's life for the better. Let us pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that you love us, that you love us enough that you came and lived and died, that we might be forgiven, that we might be brought back into relationship with you. But Lord, help us to remember that there is no one that we will ever lay eyes upon, that there is no one that will come across our paths that you don't love. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes to see the opportunities that you lay before us. Help us to see in our everyday lives how it is that we might serve you, that we might be witnesses, that we might draw in new disciples, that we might be your people. We pray it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.